Let's pray. Our Father, we are here again this time, and we're asking that you'll speak directly to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to hear you speak to us. Amen. And whatever sentences you know will apply to our hearts, Father, we just pray that you help us to grab it as you speak these things to us, to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us not to miss what you are telling us. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're told in the New Testament that the things we have recorded in the Old Testament are recorded for our learning. They're recorded so that we do not make the same mistakes people of the Old Testament times made. They are recorded so that as we read, study, and learn, we will be able to keep ourselves in the narrow path and eventually make it to our desired end. We're studying particularly the life of Samson, and we'll title the message, Samson, the Mighty and the Foolish. Already you can see from the life of Samson, if you read it before and you should have, that it is not enough to have power. We must have wisdom to go along with it. And that whatever a man may have of the knowledge of the scriptures, of natural ability to do anything, of supernatural ability, the power of God through the Holy Ghost, if he does not carefully develop wisdom that comes out of the study and the learning from the Bible, if it's just the might, the power, the ability, without wisdom to go along with all that, that person will still be a failure in life, and it's even possible to miss heaven in the end. Now, as we study the life of Samson, we ought to understand that the way his life went wasn't the way God originally intended. God intended that this man will have his power and will be a real judge in Israel that will deliver the children of Israel from their enemies and that his life should just be a straightforward record of victory, success, and wonderful achievement. That was God's intention. But because of his own foolishness, and because he did not take to heart what had been written before he came to the world, what had been written in the scriptures, he made a fool of himself. He ruined his life, ruined his ministry, and died a premature death. Now, in Judges chapter 13, verses 24 and 25, And the woman bare his son, and called his name Samson, the child and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. I read from Judges chapter 13, verses 24 and 25. His conception had been indicated by the angel that visited the mother. The mother and the father had been without child for a long time since the marriage. But then they received this angelic visitation. The angel appeared to the mother first, and then at a second time appeared to both of them, and prophesied that this woman would conceive, would bear children, would bear a child, and that um, that child will be special before the Lord. He'll be a Nazarite. And that angel describes what his life ought to be. And if there was anything significant in what the angel said, his life should be a life of discipline. You need to put that down. Discipline in the life of a person that is called of God, commissioned of God, appointed by God, sent by God. That single word, can make your life different. If you take it to heart, 
and understand that there must be discipline in your life. The discipline of a person sent by God, devoted to God, addicted to the work of God. If that word will ring in your ears and in your heart very loudly and clearly every time, your life will become a success. But if you forget that word and you live an undisciplined life, you might have to regret it through life and through eternity. The angel told um, the parents that this child that will be born, he should live a, a disciplined life. And the life of uh, discipline would make him different. Different from every other Israelite. Different from every other person living on the face of the earth at that time. Different, of course, also from the Gentiles. And discipline in the believer's life makes you different. Different from so-called Christians in other denominations and churches that you know very well. Different from even the ordinary believers in the same church that you attend because you are a worker. Different from the Gentile world. And um, his life was to be different. His appearance was to be different. What entered into his mouth was to be different. And of course, then what came out of his mouth was to be different. That man should have understood that if his appearance was to be different, his strength already made different by the Lord. And then the angel said some things you never get into his mouth, like strong drink. That man should have been intelligent that if what enters your mouth is totally to be different from what enters the mouth of other people, then I think you should be able to understand what comes out of your, of your mouth must also be different. Now, it says the child grew and the Lord blessed him. Before he ever went into the field, the Lord blessed him. Before he ever started the work that the Lord apportioned for him on earth, the Lord blessed him. In our lives, we must understand it is not service first, it is salvation first. We must be saved. We must be born again. And after we are born again, the Lord will be calling upon us. The Lord will be saying, I, I have need of you. And as we're hearing that, that he has need of us, we get into the blessings of the Lord. I've already told you last night and this morning that after we are saved, we need to be sanctified. We need our hearts to be circumcised. That is a great blessing that we need from the Lord. And then it says in verse 25, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him. The Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord. Now, it doesn't say the Spirit of the Lord moved him, but began to move him. Began to move him. Have you ever realized that um, if you are driving today, when you began to drive, you didn't do it perfectly? You were a little bit afraid when you saw an oncoming vehicle? And when you see a pole before you, you are very, very thoughtful, very careful, so as to be able to avoid that pole. And um, when you saw pedestrians, those who are walking by the side of the road, you are extremely careful when you began to drive. But then you continued driving, continued driving, continued driving, until you, saw, you see an oncoming vehicle, you don't even think about it. Because you have developed your ability to be able to pass the other vehicle without any thought in your heart, consciously, without any fear in your heart, you just pass. And you pass pedestrians by just inches. And um, the person who is not developed in driving will feel that you're almost going to crush that individual. But no, you have begun to do it, you have continued to do it until you did it perfectly well. And um, if you have learned another language, have you realized how conscious and cautious you were? When you started um, that language, you began to speak that language. But then you used the language, you read the language, you heard the language, you continued using the language, and now you use it and you, you speak it without even perhaps conscious thought like it was before. 
And whatever you are doing now, which you do perfectly, there was a time you began doing it. And at the time you began doing it, it wasn't all perfect. It was all with caution and carefulness so that um, you will not make a mistake. Now, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him. And he needed to be uh, yielding himself. Because when the Spirit of the Lord moves you, you need to yield yourself. You need to walk in line, talk in line, move in line with the moving of the Spirit. And um, he started well as the Spirit of God began to move him. But, but then it says, began to move him in the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. Now, that was within the confines of the territories of the children of Israel. Generally, the Lord does not make um, a novice, somebody just starting to start in the enemy's camp. When the Lord was going to send his own um, disciples out to go and do the work, he said, now your ministry must be limited. Try it here first. Don't go the way of the Samaritans and the way of the Gentiles. But go, go to the lost sheep of Israel. And so when you first start, you are limited at first. You know how foolish uh, some people are. That um, they feel that they have the call of God. Then in the church, now they become impatient. And you tell them to start with the house fellowship. They say, no, my call is greater than that. Start somewhere. You even If you give them the opportunity of uh, being an area leader, they don't even uh, prize it. They don't appreciate it. They feel that, well, uh, that is uh, beyond, uh, that is not up to what I want. Because God has called me. The spirit of the Lord is beginning to move. And this uh, man does not want to try out and uh, work out things uh, in an, on an easier ground. But he began to move in the camp of Dan. Many people want to be a missionary the first time they start preaching. They don't want to try that thing they feel they have here. They want to launch out. And you see, you can ruin your life completely, spiritually like that. But in the case of uh, Samson, he began this way. And as he began, the Spirit of the Lord was uh, beginning to move him, and he was beginning to learn on how to yield to the Spirit of God. In uh, chapter 15, chapter 15, from verse 14, And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Now, let's stop there. You know that this uh, man's birth had been prophesied by an angel. The parents were expecting a mysterious child. And uh, the spirit of the Lord had begun to move him. And obviously from his life that you see, uh, there seems to have been a deposit of power in his life. And obviously he was mighty all the time. But then we're told here that when the Philistines shouted against him, the Spirit of the Lord came, 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 and it came mightily upon him. There are those who feel that, well, I've got the deposit of power, all the power I need, I'm saved, sanctified, and spirit-filled. And you tell them to do anything for the Lord, they just depend upon that deposit. They take God for granted. They don't need a fresh coming of the Spirit of God. Oh, they feel all the verses I will use, I know it already. I've read the Bible through before. I've uh, studied much of the Bible. And I've preached that message before, after all. And uh, I know what to say, I know what to do. Or you call them to pray for the sick. Oh yes, they say, bring him, bring him here. They don't expect that there is uh, to be a fresh coming of the Spirit of God upon them. That's why God can't use them. God will not waste his time with such a proud, egotistic individual. 
who feels that I know it all, I can do it all. I have enough deposit of the power of God, of the Spirit of God upon me. And I don't need a fresh in feeling, a fresh coming, a fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God upon me. God can't waste time with such people. He'll have to brush them aside, throw them aside, and use people who are more humble. But you see, Samson uh, had this fresh coming of the Spirit upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his, his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, With well, the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with well, the jawbone of an ass, I have slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Remus Lehi. Now, the Spirit of God was just coming upon him. And uh, he did all these things that we have heard that he did. In um, Judges chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. And it was so told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And he compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. And were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them, and a, a bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried, uh, carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. Now you can see that power, physical power, upon him that um, he used, and yet... The physical power did not come uh, like it comes to some other people that have physical power. It came suddenly. It came as he was born. It came by the Spirit of God. And uh, the Lord wanted him to judge Israel. A great work that God gave him to do. Others had done that work before him. And if this man was wise... He should have studied those who did it before him. Now, many of us know about um, some little things about his life. And uh, I will advise that you please, on your own, find time today. Read chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. Only four chapters. And it won't take you up to 30 minutes. Only four chapters. With reading and meditation, shouldn't take you up to uh, 30 minutes. But... You'll get a lot as you read. And see how this man, who was favored of God, appointed by God, sent by God, and equipped like no other man before him was ever equipped, see how he wrecked and ruined his life. And see how he just took things for granted. Now, as, as a leader, he had a delicate position, a privileged position, but he didn't make use of that privilege uh, properly. Now, what were the foolish things we recognized in his life? When we were looking at these foolish things uh, that he did, not so as to point back to him and make fun of him. No, you must be far from that. Whenever you read of any character in the Bible, you're not making fun of um, anyone. These people have died and they've gone uh, to receive whatever their lives uh, would merit before the Lord. But then ours is to learn. Learn from the things that happen to them so that the downfall they experience we will not experience it. And it's no use just saying, well, in Jesus' name, I will not experience the same downfall. If you walk the same path, you will reach the same destination they reached. If you did the same foolish things they did, you will ruin your life and wreck your life that, like they ruined and wrecked their lives. So the only thing is that you will learn and see the pitfalls and the loopholes in their lives and avoid them. Now what do we recognize in this uh, man? Number one, he had no companion of like precious faith. He endeavored to get married. 
He never really did. He never really concentrated on wanting to actually get married in the will of God, in the plan of God. Now think about such a man, a judge in Israel, the leader in Israel, the guide in Israel, the most powerful person in Israel. Would it be difficult for him of all the 12 tribes in Israel to find a wife, a woman, that will be so selected that it will match, that a, a, a life will match its life. I don't think that will be too much difficult, searching all over that nation. If an angel had prophesied his birth, if an angel had declared and indicated the ministry he would have, was it difficult for God to send an angel again and instruct again how that man should get married? But no, he, he wasn't uh, that wise. He wasn't that careful. And you know, in your own life, if you are not careful in your marriage, no matter what you have, no matter what you know, and no matter what you experience of uh, the power of the Holy Ghost, if your marriage is upside down, if you are not careful as to who you marry, as to how you plan that marriage, and after you are married, how to develop the faith of your wife or the faith of your husband, and you develop together, you might be surprised where you find yourself in two years' time. So this man was careless and foolish about this important thing. He did not choose a woman of like precious faith. Now, what do you think of a man like this if he had an Israelite for a wife? Even if that wife, if all the wife, if all that the wife will say every morning is something, be careful, you have power, ask for wisdom. Even if that is what the wife will remind him, every day they wake up, Samson, be careful, you have power, ask for wisdom. That somebody will be reminding him all the time, all the time, that even though the power is there, even though the spirit um, is moving upon you, but you lack wisdom, you don't know how to take decision. And you don't know how to plan for things that are strategic and important and weighty, heavy. Well, unfortunate for that man that he did not have a woman like that of like precious faith. Now, whatever dreams you have been having from the Lord, whatever prophecies have been, have been um, said, prophesied over you, Whatever you are seeing of what God says, oh yes, I will do this, I will do that. How about your marriage? Look at Judges chapter 14. In verse 1, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Read it this way, of the daughters of his enemies. The Philistines were his enemies. And he saw a woman of the daughters of his enemies. And that's the only woman that looked attractive to him. Think about it. The only woman that looked attractive to him. One of the daughters of his enemies. Didn't he know that woman would be a trap for him? Didn't he know that it would be a real problem? And um, you Christians saved, sanctified, and spirit-filled? A real dynamic uh, prayer warrior, powerful preacher, effective counselor. Show me who you want to get married to, and I will show where, how you are likely to end your life. Because we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's in verse 14. This man had the Spirit of God. You know people who say, well, leave me alone. After all, you've taught us how to get saved, and I'm saved. You've taught us about sanctification, I'm sanctified. And you've taught us how to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, and the Spirit of God is upon me, so why bug my life and uh, trouble me about, uh, uh, don't marry this, don't marry that. I'm old enough to know who to get married to. Well, Samson wasn't old enough to know who to get married to. That may just be that you are resisting counseling, you are resisting the way of God and the will of God. Out of it, 
a million things. One, you'll sell yourself into the hand of your enemies. You marry one of their daughters, you are sold already. You are sold already. And uh, to come out of that net, you will cry and weep and fast. And all that the Lord will tell you is that, I told you before. You come back again and weep, I told you before. Oh Lord, it's not too heavy for me, I cannot bear it, I told you before. Oh Lord, am I going to die like this? I told you before. Are you not going to do anything to help me? I told you before. I'm fasting and waiting upon you. I told you before. You've been told before. Be not unequally yoked together with some believers. Now, who makes a non-believer beautiful in the sight of a believer? Think about it. Think about it. You are a believer. Who makes an unbeliever beautiful in your sight? Not God. God doesn't do that. Is a person at the back of your neck. Who has been looking for a way to ruin you, push you down, destroy you? And uh, you have been praying and preaching and going up and down saying, I will serve the Lord. And he's at your back. He's saying, I will catch him. I will catch him. I will catch him. And every time he tries this, it fails. He says, I will still catch him. He tries another thing, he fails, and he says, I will still catch him. And he's at your back pushing you and pushing you and pushing you. And one day you begin to see an unbeliever, a lady. And that unbeliever suddenly becomes beautiful in your sight. And the devil says, now I get him. Or you're a woman. And um, a non-believer becomes handsome and nice and good. That's just the one you want. The devil has got you. Be not unequally yoked together with some believers. Then it says, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? Now, that was the first thing that this um, Samson did. He had no companion of like precious faith, and he began to seek after the unequal yoke. Number two. I told you to read um, Judges on your own, chapters 13 and 16. How many of you will do that today? When we have question uh, time in the evening, I'm going to ask you. You should have read Judges chapters 13 to 16 before we come in the evening. Will you do that? Yes. Now, as you read through all those chapters, you'll find something. He had no counselor. My brother, my sister, do you know that no matter how great you are, how powerful you are, there are times you just don't know which way to go. You just don't know which way to go. And whoever you are, however high you may be, whatever passages of the Bible you may know, there are just times in your life you don't know what to do. And uh, you will need people to counsel you, to talk with you, and say, um, why, this is a simple problem. Why don't you go this way? And you'll say, I never thought of that uh, before. Thank you for telling me that. Now I just see. It opens up to me as the flowers open up before the morning sun. But this man, he never talked to anybody. He was a lone ranger. He was an isolated warrior. He faced Philistines alone. He faced his difficulties alone. He faced his life alone. And uh, anytime he wanted to go to the Philistines to go and uh, wage any war or battle, you know, he never told anybody. He never even said bye-bye to anybody. That uh, my brothers and sisters uh, be praying for me. I am going for such and such a thing. No, not at all. Not something. He lived such a life as just to be independent of everybody. No counseling. No advice. No people around him. And yet... He was not fighting a personal battle. He was fighting a national battle. Think of a man like that. That will fight national battles and never talk to anybody. Never ask anybody any question. And the man didn't have wisdom. He only had power. 
And do you know that all his life, after all, with all this great power, you know, if you read them, um, all the chapters have told you to read, it says, at the time of his death, he killed how many people? At the end of his life. When he pulled on those two pillars, and that um, place uh, fell upon all the lords of the Philistines there, how many people? No, no, no. There's a particular number mentioned. 3,000. And then it says that at the time of his death, he killed more than he had killed all the rest of his life. Which means that all the rest of his life, with all that power, he didn't kill up to 6,000. All his life. Uh -uh. Even David that had uh, less power physically killed more people. Because David surrounded himself with other warriors, other workers. And he chose captains over uh, some groups, uh, battalions of uh, soldiers. But this man was a foolish man. He just fought all alone. No advisor. No counselor. Nobody to go along with him. And how about you? Zona leader, you do do it all alone. After all, you are saved, you are sanctified, you are powerful. But can you do this work alone? Without a counselor? Even in your own personal lives? Without somebody who knows more than you know? To say, brother, this is where to put this in. This is how to do this. When last were you counseled? On your own personal life? On the work of the Lord that you are doing? Or do you feel that you are so powerful, you are so great, that uh, you don't need uh, anybody at all to talk with you? Well, remember something. Now, we're told in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Where no counsel is, the people fall. So then you understand one of the reasons why this uh, Samson ruined himself. Now, look up here. Suppose Samson sought counseling. In wanting to go to Timnath to get one of the daughters of the Philistines, one of the daughters of his enemies. Uh, uh, even the young people in Israel will counsel him and tell him, don't do that. You don't have to be ahead of uh, the tribe in Israel to even know that that one is wrong. You don't need to be a great person, a great Bible reader in Israel to know that you shouldn't do that because they have been told in Deuteronomy chapter 7, they shouldn't do it. They had been told in uh, Joshua chapter 23, they shouldn't do it. Anybody in Israel knew that. But uh, he didn't receive counseling. And eventually after he had gone, he didn't tell his uh, parents before he went. Then after he had seen somebody there, he came back to the parents and said, get her for me. She pleases me well. That's not seeking counseling. That's giving us information. That's what I want to do. Support me. If you like me, support me. If you don't support me, it means that uh, you are not rewarding me well. All the work I've done in this church, I've been a house fellowship leader. I know that. Uh, I know when we started. I tried. I did everything. Now this is the time of my marriage. You must help me. Now, counseling is different. You are not seeking for counseling. You have chosen the unbeliever. You have said that is the person you love. You are going to marry the person, whether the church likes it or not, whether the Bible goes against it or not, this is the person I'm marrying. And uh, since I've been a worker in the church all this time, help me out. Help me if you really love me. You know, that's what Samson was saying. Samson was saying, my parents, that's the person I want. I'm not asking for your advice. I'm not asking for counseling. I'm just giving you information that that is what I am going to do. Don't do like that. Seek counseling. The person who did it before you, he ruined his life. And you remember Solomon? It's women that made that man again to ruin his own life too. 
And that man was so wise, he wrote the Proverbs. He wrote uh, many songs and many Proverbs. And he was so rich, yet Nehemiah said, Him did outlandish women cause to sin. Who made those outlandish women uh, appear nice and beautiful and appropriate uh, to Solomon, the devil? And if the devil did it for such a man, think about yourself. Think about yourself. Many men have fallen because of strange women. Now, we have seen that Samson did not receive um, any counseling. And because of that, he ruined his life. Also, I've mentioned, this is my third point, that he lived an isolated life, fighting national battles all alone. And uh, you are found in this uh, nation, in this country, and no doubt you are found even among us, members of Deeper Christian Life Ministry, that sometimes the devil will deceive one of our members. And uh, this member will uh, come to say, I can do the work all alone. I thank God for all that God has taught me through Deeper Christian Life Ministry. But now it has come to time for me to stay by myself. And uh, he says, well, I'm not fighting with anybody. I'm not uh, opposed to anybody. I know God has raised up deeper Christian life ministry. But God has sent me forth. My brother, do you know what you are saying? Do you really know what you are saying? That you go all alone in isolation to go and fight the devil. And you know, we never find them coming back. All you find is that if you travel far enough, you come across the skeleton of a dead body somewhere, spiritually. And you say, ah, this skeleton looks like uh, the body structure of somebody I know. And when you begin to investigate, you find that it is this person that went all alone in isolation against the devil by himself. Hmm. Be careful. Daniel was praying, and God sent an angel from heaven to go and give him an answer. And he was coming alone, that angel, and the, and the kings of Persia. The spirits of the power of the air, they met him on the way. They said, where are you going? And they delayed him there for 21 days. You want to walk in isolation? An angel couldn't do it. And other angels in heaven had to come to his rescue. To be able to bring that answer down. And when Jesus was sending those two disi uh, those disciples, he sent them two by two. When he was going to send um, the 70 again, he sent them two by two. Even ordinary go and take an ass and the cult of an ass that he will ride triumphantly into Jerusalem. He sent Peter and John even to go and take an ass. And when he wanted to say, now, I need uh, some of you, my disciples, to go and ask the uh, nobleman of the house, where will the master have the Passover? You know how many people he sent? He sent two of them. And in Acts chapter 13, separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul. And when Barnabas had even forsaken Saul, you know what uh, the church did? Uh, they, they chose um, Silas to go along with him. Now, be very careful. Study your Bible. But you know all these people who are going about in isolation and they say, well, I'm so powerful, I can do this, I can do that. In unity, there is strength. And as we're together, and we live together, we work together, we pray together, we study together, iron sharpness, iron. Now think about a person who has, um, you know, just left in isolation. And uh, workers retreat like this, he cannot attend. And yet, his vessel of oil is already leaking. The oil of anointing, leaking out of his life. And there is no meeting like this to come back and fill the vessel again and mend the broken part of the vessel until he discovers he is now totally shallow. He has lost everything. And to come back, he is ashamed. Now, Samson ruined his life like that because of isolation. Now, why do you want to be isolated? This work belongs to the whole church. 
It is not my ministry. It is not your ministry. It is our ministry. Why do you want to do the work of thousands all alone by yourself? Why? Why do you want to carry the whole load all alone by yourself? The load that Jesus himself alone was not able to carry. And he was saying, my father, if this cup will not pass by me, thy will be done. And you are so bold, you are so powerful. You want to carry the cross all alone. You want to carry the load all alone. You want to do the work all alone. Samson made that mistake. Something that Moses could not do. Moses, that man of God. Great man of God. The man God said, he spoke to face to face. That prayerful man, powerful man. That man that appeared before Pharaoh. And mighty signs and wonders were done. But you know, as he was coming in the wilderness, the load became so heavy. And he said, God, if it is like this, kill me. That's the load you want to carry alone. And you have got a vision. You have got a ministry. And you have got uh, something. You are going to do it. You want to do it all alone. You want to die. Moses said, God, if it is like this, kill me. And uh, God said, I know your problem. You can't carry it alone. Make 70 other men to come. And I will take off your spirit. I will put it. I will put that spirit upon them. They will carry the load with you. So it will become easier. Look at this foolish man, Samson. Everywhere he went, all alone. He went into the camp of the enemy, all alone. He wanted to kill a lion, all alone. He wanted to fight the Philistines. He saw the jawbone of an ass. He didn't see what was coming at his back. And he fought and fought and fought. As you read uh, that story, do you know that even after killing 1,000 people, he didn't have water to drink. He was so thirsty. He said, God, I will die now. Ordinary water. That uh, a six-year-old person could have said something, you need water, and just go and bring the water. That's ordinary water. Nobody around him. No wife, no counselor, no friend, nobody. And you know there are people who live like that. And uh, the devil will corner such people all. You cannot live alone. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Where is the powerful man who can challenge the devil all alone? Where is the powerful man who can do this great work all alone? That's why unity among the house fellowship leaders are so important. You need the other people. The other people need you. Now, number four. Evil association. That was in his life. You know, you never read about this man going to the various tribes in Israel, having any friend there. Anytime you read about him, he's in another house of the Philistines. He's in, in the border again of the Philistines. Evil association. But... How about ourselves? Ask yourself, who are your friends? Close, intimate friends, who are they? Because as, um, as long as you are having all these close, intimate relationship with the enemies, how will you be able to keep the victory in your life? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verse 33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. This man was uh, too familiar with um, the people of the land, but when you read about him, you'll see that he was always attracted to women. When he went to the Philistines, he wasn't attracted to the men as such. He was attracted to the women. And as you read about him, he's either with one woman or the other. And then in his life, 
we don't ever find him. Except um, at the time when uh, he had lost his two eyes and he now started to pray. But all his life, he wasn't, prayer was not his, um, the thing that was common in his life. When he got into trouble, like um, anybody will pray when he gets into trouble, it's just when trouble is knocking. But for it to be the habit of his life, no, this man did not know prayer as habit. He did not know prayer as habit. He was born with the Spirit of God upon him. He was born with some prophecies waiting to be fulfilled in his life. He was born with uh, his father and his mother telling him stories and testimonies. And he just rested on his oars. Prayerless man. Prayerless man. And um, God couldn't get his attention to be speaking to him. But look at other men that lived before him, a man like Moses. Very often, he'll fall upon his face. Difficulty will come, he'll fall upon his face. He'll want to pray, very, very often. But in the case of this man, he just, you know, lived a carefree life. And uh, prayer wasn't a deep commitment of his life. Look at Joshua. Joshua was just a dedicated, devoted man, a man of prayer. And um, in your own life, if you are missing out prayer in your life, well, thank God you are still alive. Thank God you are still alive. But in a nation that is filled with witches and wizards, you are prayerless. In a community that is filled with uh, wicked men and women, you are prayerless. In, the, in a time that the devil is running up and down, to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, you are prayerless. Thank God you are still alive. There are more lions in this world than you have ever seen. But he says he will give the man that is prayerful power to tread upon the lion and the adder. He says that those who are depending upon him, they will tread upon serpents and scorpions, and nothing shall by any means hurt them. You live in a community like this, and you don't know how to wake up in the morning and read your Bible and pray and call upon the Lord your God. Don't you know that the devil is not happy with your life? That you are a Christian, that you are a worker, that you are turning many people to the Lord, and you live a life of carelessness, of prayerlessness. It is grace that has kept you alive. But remember, if you are careless with that grace and you are prayerless, those who have gone before us who are prayerless, their bones are all scattered in the wilderness. Be very careful. You need to pray. And um, people say, I don't know how to pray. Everybody knows how to pray. If you know how to sit down with your friend and talk for 30 minutes, you know how to, how to sit with the Savior if he's your friend and talk for the same 30 minutes. If you know how to get, get to your uncle and begin to reveal your mind to your uncle, begin to tell your need to your uncle, saying, uncle, you just, need must, you just need to help me. I've suffered a lot. Well, go and tell God exactly the same thing. That is prayer. If you know how to make petition to your boss and say, ah, boss, I've been working in this place for such a long time. Ah, what have I done? And you write and write and write. Write that same petition to God. That is prayer. If you know how to complain to the zonal leader, saying, zonal leader, look now, let me see the GS. After all, uh, I, I have uh, this problem and I've been telling, are you not concerned? And uh, you bug him and you talk to him and you say, well, I just must see him this week. Well, that same thing you are telling your zona, that is prayer. Tell it to God and it is prayer. You know how to pray. If you know how to tell people where something is paining you, when you tell God just that same thing, that is prayer. And you know, everybody could have, you know, just gone to God. If, if we're real workers, instead of uh, just gossiping and uh, just complaining and just talking to people, we can face God and go and tell that thing to God and uh, tell him in the name of Jesus. And those things uh, will be done. That is praying. But the man was prayerless. Not only that. He was not a man that uh, was given to reading the Bible. And you can tell 
this uh, man Samson, that wasn't uh, uh, one of his favorites. You know, people have uh, things that they just must do every time. And a leader must give himself to the study of the Bible. Now please listen to me. Not searching for someone to preach. You may be studying the Bible, searching for someone to preach. That doesn't mean that you are studying the Bible for yourself. But a minister of the gospel, a preacher of the gospel, should be studying the Bible for his own life. What did God tell um, Joshua? This book shall not depart out of thy mouth. But you will meditate there in day and night that you will be able to know what to tell other people know, that you will be able to observe and do all things that are written therein. That's the purpose. And uh, Samson was not a studious man. He wasn't a man who could sit down. He didn't have that discipline in his life. And I told you, if you are not a man of discipline, you will soon be wrecked and ruined. And um, he couldn't sit down to read. What were the kings, uh, those who were to be chosen as kings or as judges, what were they to do? Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his government, he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. He shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law, and these statutes to do them. Now, that had been written down, that if anybody was going to be a judge, anybody was going to be a king, sitting upon the throne in Israel, he will write out the law. That is the Pentateuch. Genesis to Deuteronomy were regarded as just one book with five sections. Section 1, Genesis. Section 2, um, Exodus. Section 3, Leviticus. Section 4, Numbers. And Section 5, Deuteronomy. That was the way they knew it. And they were to write the whole thing down and they were to read therein. And uh, something never had time for that. Never had time for that. And um, yourself as a minister, as a leader, how much time do you have? Thy word have I kept in my heart that I might not sin against you. Timothy, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Give attendance to reading. Study this word. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Eat the word of God. Read it regularly. Samson was foolish in that he couldn't do it. I've given you six points about um, the foolishness of this man. Number one. He had no companion of like precious faith. He sought after the unequal yoke. Number two, no counselors, no advisors. Even in the major points of his life, he never felt it was important to seek counseling. And um, point three, he lived an isolated life. And I told you that he fought national battles all alone. Number four, he kept evil association. He was always drawn to the daughters of his enemies. Number five, he was prayerless. He didn't develop uh, his prayer life. Number six, he did not read and meditate on the word of God. Number seven, he was a talkative. He talked too much. He talked too much. You could get any information from him. And uh, what does the Bible say? Proverbs chapter 10. This is what constituted the foolishness in the man. This is what brought his downfall. And we're learning all these things so that we can avoid the danger, the grave danger that um, he had. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. 
But he that refraineth his lips is wise. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 5, verse 3. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of his words. And the moment you found um, that Samson was talking too much to Delilah, and um, he, she kept, he kept on talking and talking and talking, you would have known, I'm hearing the voice of a fool. In our lives, we must know how to refrain our tongue. Uh, discipline life uh, means that you'll discipline your tongue. You'll discipline what comes out of your mouth. The angel had uh, instructed that that man must be disciplined and must watch out for what goes in into his mouth. And uh, he should have been wise enough that if, if you regulate and control the things that come in, you must also regulate and control the things that come out. Number eight. He carelessly revealed the secrets of the Lord to dogs and swine, to the temptress. He hired her lot to, to destroy himself. And then he'll give, he'll give a different answer. And Elijah would um, carry out that, and then will say, The Philistines are upon you, and then he will rise up. And then Elijah will say, you have not lost your power. That foolish man should have known this woman was seeking for him to lose his power. You have deceived me, now tell me the truth. Then he will tell another lie. Then the woman said, you are a liar. You are lying unto me. Wasn't that another problem in his life? He got into lying and deceit. That's number nine. What does the Bible say? All liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with brimstone, with fire and brimstone. And uh, what has Jesus told us? Cast not your pearls before swine. Cast not your pearls, your costly things, before the dogs. Wasn't this a gentle dog, Delilah? And yet he was revealing the secret of the Lord to this uh, foolish woman, to this temptress. Eventually, when the woman was crying day and night, tormenting him and troubling him, he said, all right, I'll tell you. And he told him the secret of the Lord upon his life. That was the last thing. Not that that was the only serious thing. All the things I've been telling you are very, very serious. But the devil was coming a step at a time. A step at a time. With a day of prayerlessness, the devil came nearer. With a day missing the word of God, not reading the word of God, not meditating on the word of God, the devil came nearer. With a lie, with a deceit, the devil came nearer. And um, with uh, not having any companion of like precious faith, uh, the unequal yoke he was seeking, the devil came nearer. And eventually when he told the secret of the Lord, the devil took possession. His air was gone, his power was gone. And that, old, that woman said, the Philistines are upon you. And he went out to shake himself as at other times. The power had gone. They caught him. They removed his eyes. And they took him to be grinding and making a sport, entertainment for his enemies. No more a judge. No more a captain. No more a leader. No more a worker. No more destroy, able to destroy the enemy's territory. Now they made him to be entertaining his enemies. But eventually, the air began to grow. And uh, he said, God, give it to me this time. But I will die with my enemies. Look at his premature death. What was he to live for again? He had lost his reputation. He had lost his character. He had lost his prestige. He had lost everything. All that he depended upon him, upon now, was the end time grace. That Lord, give me this grace and let me die in grace, even though I die with my enemies. What a shameful death. And he died in the territory of the enemy. 
A man who was born for, for victory. He lived a life like that. A man who was born so that all over in the history books of the world, they would have been saying, no man ever lived like that. Look at his miserable life. We have studied it so that you now, at the point of writing the history of your life, with your character, with your ministration, with the work and the commission God has given you, you will not ruin your life like he did. We have learned a lot from this man. He was mighty but foolish. Whatever you have got from the Lord, get scriptural wisdom along with it. Don't live alone. Don't walk alone. Don't live in isolation. Surround yourself with other workers here. And um, seek counseling. Don't uh, just go alone. People who are more powerful than you are, they have ruined their lives because they fought in isolation. Be wise, be united with the body of Christ. Rise up and let us pray. Open your heart to the Lord. We have learned a lot from that man.